Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. The definition of an articulator is a mechanical instrument which simulates the temporal mandibular joints and jaw members to which dental casts can be attached. Now, the manner in which we attach dental casts to an articulator will affect the accuracy of that uh, given uh, simulation of jaw movement which the articulator reproduces. Now, what we would like to do is to show how the articulation of casts into an articulator is a three-part problem. The first part would be to, uh, to get the maxillary cast in the instrument in its proper relationship to the temporal mandibular joint. The second part of the problem would be to relate the mandibular cast to the maxillary cast properly. And then the third part of the problem would be to characterize the articulator through its various adjustments and this would then more accurately simulate the given patient. If we look at the graphic illustration, to refresh our memory, we see that the articulator, the lower member of the articulator representing the mandible and the maxillary part of the articulator representing the maxilla and the condylar portion of the articula articulator represents the temporal mandibular joint articulation. Now the first part of our objectives is to relate the maxillary cast to the opening and closing axis of the patient or the, not of the patient, actually of the articulator. So we would like to relate this maxillary cast to the arbitrary axis of the patient and the true opening and closing axis of the articulator. Now to do that, we must use a device called a face bow. The face bow, as we see it, is composed of several components. First of all, it is a U-shaped frame and the device will, will do what we will relate what we want them to, what we want it to. It will relate the arbitrary axis, which we will put this portion over the arbitrary axis, to the uh, maxillary cast or maxillary dentition, and which will be attached to the bite fork. I'm going to take it apart and, and get a little bit more specific about its use. It has a U-shaped frame, a caliper-like condylar extension rod. This has a calibration or numbers on it, and this, these numbers are used to center the face bow both on the patient and the articulator. In the anterior portion, we have the bite fork uh, support rod uh, clamp and this holds the bite fork in position when we place it into the mouth. The, to the bite fork wax must be added to record the impressions of the patient's dentition. Looking at the skull we can see the practical use of the bite fork and the face bow. We look at the wax portion or the wax that has been added to the bite fork portion, we see that we have recorded impressions of the maxillary dentition. Now we can see what we were trying to relate are the hinge axis the black rods here would represent the uh, horizontal uh, axis of the opening and closing movement on the patient. We see with that we use the condylar extension rods to relate to that axis. 
and we are then capturing the maxillary dentition on the bite fork and locking that position. It has nothing, the bite for, or the face bow has nothing to do with the mandible. The mandible here is just holding the bite fork in position. I could take a bite, a arbitrary face bow transfer from a patient without the uh, man, mandible closing against the bite fork. The face bow merely relates the arbitrary axis of the patient to the, the maxillary arch. There are other types of face bow which will determine, help to determine a true hinge axis on a patient, but the snow type face bow that we have here utilizes only an arbitrary uh, determination of the hinge axis. Now, we will show the practical application of the face bow on a uh, patient. To make a face bow transfer, one of the first things we must do is to determine the arbitrary hinge axis on the patient. Now, there are several arbitrary points. The one we're going to use is 12 millimeters in front of the posterior border of the tragus of the ear on a line to the external canthus of the eye. We'll mark that point and make a slight X over it so that when we position the condylar rod of the, of the uh, face bow, it does not disappear completely. Now we're going to do this on the other side also. Okay. And we're going to place an X over that dot likewise. Now the next portion of the face bow transfer is to adapt the wax to the bite fork frame. Now we can use several techniques for warming the wax, but we'll use for, for our purposes uh, warm water in a rubber bowl and making sure that the wax is heated all the way through and pliable. I'm going to take the wax and divide it or start it making a roll which is about approximately quarters of the width of the base plate wax strip. We must reheat this from time to time. A Bunsen burner can also be used or alcohol torch of some sort as a, as a supply of dry heat. Now I'm going to apply this to the bite fork. I'm going to turn over the ends and wrap it around the under surface of the bite fork. Now what I'd like to do is to make sure that it is sealed to the, the wax is sealed to the bite fork. And to do this, I need a source of dry heat, such as a Bunsen burner or torch. I make sure that it is sealed and the wax is an integral portion of, not, uh, going to become an integral portion of the bite fork. I'm going to warm this again. I want to make sure that it is adequately heated all the way through. We're going to use this to register the occlusal impression of the maxillary arch. If we have 
a maxillary cast of the patient available. This helps us to fabricate the exact configuration or the U-shapeness of the wax, the arch shape of the wax that we need. So I'm heating this all the way through and I'm going to take it to the patient while it is still warm and register the occlusal imprint. You want to lay your head back? Mm -hmm. Okay, now I want to make sure that the anterior rod of the bite fork does not cross the midline. Comes out maybe on a slight angle from the patient's face so that it doesn't interfere with the incisal pin when I mount, uh, utilize the face bow transfer to mount the maxillary cast on the articulator. Now, we apply a moderate amount of pressure, but we don't need uh, uh, anything more than a registration of the cusp tips. I'm now waiting for the wax to chill slightly before removing it. We need only a registration of the cusp tips and not a complete impression of the tooth. I'm going to remove this from the patient's mouth. I can see the impression of the teeth. This is actually probably a little bit deeper than I would than I would care to see. So we can trim that back slightly and I'm going to go to the laboratory table to do that. Looking carefully at the wax portion of the bite fork, what we want to ensure is that there are no soft tissue impingements, particularly in tuberosity areas, where the wax may have displaced the soft tissue in the mouth, but when we make an attempt to position the cast, this will prevent the cast from sitting into the wax impression. We'll use a sharp knife, heated first slightly with dry heat, Bunsen burner, etc., and trim carefully the wax away from this area. Now, all I really would need to make the transfer of the maxillary cast to the articulator are three points of uh, impressions of the maxillary dentition. Perhaps one in the molar area, one in the anterior area, and one in the opposite molar area. This would add stability or would lend itself to stability and uh, would be all that we would need. But I've got much more than that and probably deeper than I wanted. Now another thing I'd like to point out is the periphery of this wax, which extends beyond the buccal surfaces of the teeth. This could be uncomfortable in the patient's cheek, so we're going to remove uh, that peripheral portion just to make it a wee bit smaller. When we do this, we must be careful not to destroy the occlusal indentations that we have initially uh, the, the occlusal impressions that we've initially made. Perhaps could trim a little more. The, the other thing we can do at times if, if we have gone over an infrabulge area on, the, on a specific tooth, it is also possible to trim just a little bit of that portion off of the wax indentation. But what our primary purpose is, is to 
have the cast seating in a stable fashion into that wax impression. Now we're going to go to the patient's mouth and center the bite fork or and the and the face bow uh, frame. Okay, we're going to place the place the bite fork in the patient's mouth again, seeking its original indentations, making sure that it is stable in the mouth, not wobbly. We haven't distorted it. I'm going to place a cotton roll on either side. Close down on that. Okay. To even the pressure out and let the patient hold that in position. Now you can just hold it with your lower jaw. No, that's fine. You can put your hands down. That's fine. She's holding it with her lower jaw and the, the cotton rolls, even the pressure on it so that it isn't tilting the bite fork in one, uh, to one side or the other. Now, again, I want to emphasize that the mandible has no part in this transfer. It is merely a relationship of the hinge axis, the arbitrary hinge axis, to the maxillary dentition. Now, to center the face bow or the U-shaped uh, caliper on the face, we will initially set one of the condylar rods at an arbitrary point. And I'm going to use a 7 on this side. Now, the idea behind this is to average the two readings. Now I'm placing it, and turn your head to the right, all the way over to the right. I'm going to place this condylar rod over the arbitrary axis point that I have recorded. And it's at that point on either side of the head that I'm going to record the dimension. Okay, you want to just look forward again? Okay. And we should be just barely touching the surface of the skin, not indenting the skin at all. It should be just slightly away from the skin. Okay, I'm going to tighten that just slightly so I can make a reading. Now, on one side, I have a reading of 7, and this is a millimeter scale, and that's actually indicating 70 millimeters. On the other side, I have a reading of 58. So if I average the two readings, it comes to about 64. So using a setting of 64 on either side should help me center this face bow. I'm going to check this out. And that is just about perfect. Okay, now I'm going to release the support rod clamp of the face bow so that it slides freely on the anterior portion of the frame. Now, now we're going to align the hole in the center of the bite fork clamp with this support or, or with the bite fork itself. I'm sliding it into position, trying to hold this over the arbitrary axes, and then securing the clamp. Now that's slightly off. I'm going to release it and try to reposition it just a little bit again.
A dental assistant is very handy in such cases. Okay, now we're going to, we have a little wrench, and we insert it in the bottom portion of the clamp, and I'm securing it even tighter to maintain that relationship. I'm making sure I'm still over my arbitrary axis points. Okay, we can now take this from the patient. And we'll be going to the laboratory. Open. We'll be going to the laboratory to position the maxillary cast on the articulator. The first uh, laboratory step in the laboratory procedure of fixing the cast to the articulator is to, again, as we did on the patient, center the face bow uh, on the articulator. This is done uh, to bring to the articulator the relative positioning of the maxillary dentition to the rotation uh, axes. Now, we know, we realize that the vertical axis width is not the same on the articulator as it is on the patient. In some articulators, there is an adjustable intercondylar distance. On the average type of articulator, this is not uh, the case. So, we will have new figures on the caliper. They will not be identical to that of the patient. What we are interested in is that it is again centered on the articulator. The second thing we are, uh, we are concerned with is a third point of reference. If we are to transfer a plane, a relation, or transfer the relationship of a plane, we need three points. Two points we have are the condylar or the horizontal axis uh, determinations that we, that we took from a patient, and we have a horizontal axis on the articulator, so we have one on either side, so that, those are two of the uh, third points of ref, or two points of reference. The third point of reference that we will use with this Hanna articulator is a notch, there are two notches on the incisal pin of the articulator. We will use uh, uh, the lower notch to coincide with the central incisors of the maxillary cast. Now, if I place this cast in here just momentarily, I will see that what we're attempting to do is to line up the incisal edges of the cast uh, between the two lines on the incisal pin. And that is the third point of reference that we will use. Uh, further discussion of third point of reference will be made uh, in subsequent lectures. We would then need to fasten the cast to the articulator to, to something which is removable, and what we will use is a ring, a mounting ring, and I want to note that the mounting ring has a groove in it and a central uh, a hole. Now, the way it is affixed to the articulator is that the groove is positioned over this pin on the upper member of the articulator. So the notch surface goes toward the upper surface of the articulator. Now this, the threads on these mounting uh, plates should be lubricated from time to time with a, a, an oil. And this will prevent it from binding. We can also uh, put a little wax over the surface of this pin. 
This will facilitate the removal of the rings and tightening of the rings. If we have just a little relief over that, that uh, screw, when we tighten it down, it will not uh, wedge, the screw will not push the plaster off of the ring. Okay, now uh, we'd also like to have something to support the cast when I place it in the articulator and then put plaster on it and close it. I want to make sure that nothing is going to distort the relationship of the uh, bite fork to the frame of the face bow. So we have a little support for the face bow. And it is positioned on the lower member of the articulator on the uh, screw in the center. It is a self-leveling type of a device. And all we do is screw it on the lower member of the articulator, then raising each individual section until it supports the face bow. Now we can apply a little pressure to that without distur disturbing the relationship on the uh, rounded anterior portion of the uh, bite frame. Now we want to look carefully at the casts we are going to use. We want to ensure that there are no bubbles on the surfaces of the teeth. In pouring uh, stone or rubberized molds or alginated impressions, there are little bubbles that sometimes accumulate on the surfaces. If there are any bubbles on the surfaces, just flick them off with the tip of uh, your number seven wax spatula. It will work very nicely. Okay, the other portion of the cast that we're going to uh, look at is the back side, and we want to notch or score the uh, upper surface of the cast so that the plaster is one uh, more, more apt not to break loose, and uh, secondly, if it does break loose, we have a little key with which to fit it back into so we can reattach it. So we cut some grooves in the cast for this purpose. Okay, now when handling casts and mounting the casts on an articulator, we want to make sure that the occlusal surfaces of the teeth do not get wet. However, we should wet the base of the cast. We should wet the base of the cast because when the plaster is setting, it will, it will make an attempt to take the water from this top surface of the cast and you will get a poor seal from the impression plaster to the stone of the cast. So we are going to soak the base of the cast just for a minute or so, or just a few seconds, until we feel that it, it, it has absorbed a little water into the surface of the stone. Okay, now we're ready to position the cast in the articulator or on the face bow. We make a trial closing of the articulator to make sure that we have enough room for plaster to fit between the mounting ring and the stone cast. We may have to further uh, grind the cast a little bit. If the patient is a particularly small patient, 
you would see that the face bow positioning in the articulator would bring the maxillary arch more toward the condyl condylar areas. And on a larger patient, it would probably, the maxillary cast would sit further down away from the condylar areas. Okay, we are now ready to make a creamy mix of plaster and place it on the uh, upper surface of the cast and then close down into it. I will not attempt to make a smooth uh, job. The, the, what I'm interested in with the first mix is just to tack the cast to the ring. I can add plaster later uh, to make it uh, a, a more firm attachment and uh, more aesthetic. Okay, I have here impression plaster which sets relatively uh, rapidly and uh, under the lights it may set e even more rapidly so we're going to be very careful adding water and what I'd like to end up with is a creamy mix. It's going to be necessary to add a little more powder. and I'm going to spatulate it against the side of the bowl. Now with this creamy mix, I'm going to just add enough to tack it to the ring, to the mounting ring. I can add a little bit to the interlocks on the upper surface of the ring. This ensures a good bind to the mounting ring. Okay, we're now going to let this this hardened and when we when it sets we have accomplished our first objective that is relating the arbitrary axis or relating the horizontal axis closing axis to the maxillary dentition in its proper relationship we've taken the relationship from the patient and transferred it to the articulator next part uh, of the problem of mounting the cast properly in the articulator is to establish a correct maxillomandibular relationship. That is to relate the mandibular cast into, uh, to the maxillary cast in the relationship that we desire. Now for our purposes in this exercise we are going to use centric occlusion. Centric occlusion if we look at the skull is the maximum interdigitation of the dentition, the maximum contact between the teeth. It's a habitual position. And other reference or other uh, positions of the jaw may be used for different uh, restorations in dentistry. Uh, centric relation, the, the posterior terminal hinge position of the mandible is used sometimes. Uh, but centric occlusion is the position we will be using uh, on, our, on mounting this mandibular cast, our given mandibular cast, to the articulator. It is the most cranial position of the articulator. And uh, centric occlusion is the, is the uh, position that you would normally uh, close your jaw to. If someone instructed a patient to uh, close uh, and squeeze together, they would probably go to the centric occlusion position. I want you to note that any mandibular position is three-dimensional in nature. It, is, it has an anteroposterior dimension, it has a lateral dimension to it, and then a vertical dimension to it. So with 
with centric occlusion, the maximally interdigitated position, it is the most cranial position uh, that the mandible will get to the maxilla with the teeth in contact. Before mounting or securing the mandibular cast uh, to the articulator, we must be sure uh, that the centric locks of the articulator are secured, that the, there is a little pin which uh, rises behind the condylar ball, uh, and it is pushing the condylar element forward against the centric stop thumb screw. Now that should be done on both sides so that we are ensured that the the uh, the articulator, the upper member of the articulator is maximally forward. We will also look at the occlusal surfaces of the uh, mandibular cast and we're going to chip away any bubbles which may be there in order to attain the maximally interdigitated position of the teeth we obviously cannot have any interferences on the occlusal surfaces okay now then we will invert the articulator on this mounting stand and then Again, we have uh, notched the mandibular uh, cast. The base of this cast should be, again, soaked in water. But the maximally interdigitated position of the cast should be achieved, should have an instructor make sure that you are in this position. You can see that the cast is firmly seated. We would then mix a little plaster, place it on the base of the cast, and then holding uh, the cast in that position, we will lock the, uh, the, the articulator lower member uh, down onto the incisal pin, making sure you are touching the incisal table with the pin and we we'll, would let that plaster sit uh, to uh, completion. We would then have the mandibular cast related in its proper starting relationship to the, uh, the mandibular cast related in its proper starting relationship to the maxillary cast. And the second part of our objective would be fulfilled. We are now ready to uh, characterize the articulator with the uh, uh, movements from the patient. Now we have the we have accomplished the first two part or first two parts of the problem: the orientation of the maxillary cast and the orientation of the mandibular cast. We would now like to set some of the movable components of the articulator to correspond to some of the, of the movements of the patient. One method in doing this and using the average type instrument is to secure a protrusive wax bite. Now if we look at the skull, we see that in the centric occlusion position, the condyle is in a relatively seated position inside the fossa. Now we don't know exactly what that position is, but what we're going to attempt to do with a protrusive bite is to capture the position forward, this forward position approximately four to six millimeters, uh, and capture the condyle in that forward position. Now I'm going to place this protrusive wax bite that I have already fabricated for the skull in position. We would be doing the same thing uh, on a patient with wax in its soft state, then having the patient close into the wax, and we see that the condyle has indeed come forward. It was seated originally, and now it, it, it was seated originally, and now it has come forward approximately four millimeters or so 
And this is the position of the condyle that we want to capture to determine the inclination that the condyle follows in its protrusive excursion. I want to point out that the thickness of the wax in the posterior is usually thicker than the wax in the anterior. This is a phenomenon called Christensen's phenomenon, just indicating that the posterior part of the occlusion here is disocluding uh, faster and, and its influence of the condylar inclination is, is seen. Now, we would have the patient closed down to near contact of the anterior teeth, but not necessarily penetrating the wax. We would try to prevent a penetration of the wax in the anterior. Again, I want to emphasize that it is just a four to six millimeter uh, protrusive excursion of the mandible. It has nothing to do with an end-to-end -end relationship or et cetera. It is just four to six millimeters forward. If the patient was originally in an end-to-end -end bite, a class three type of occlusion, it would mean that the lower jaw would have to go forward of the anterior, of the maxillary anterior teeth to capture a protrusive excursion, and we would thus then do so. It has nothing to do with the relationship of the anterior teeth. It is a four millimeter excursion of the mandible. We will now go to the patient to show the, how we clinically, uh, how we clinically attain a, whack, a protrusive wax bite registration. Now we will first make uh, a few practice uh, protrusive excursions with the patient to uh, make sure that they realize what we want. Sometimes it uh, helps if we give the patient a hand mirror to look at their teeth while they're making the excursion. Uh, but we want to go, or we want to show them exactly the position uh, that we want to achieve. So we practice with this patient, have her come forward and bite. Because she is in a uh, normal occlusion, a class one type of occlusion, her protrusive excursion is almost a end-to-end -end relationship of the anterior teeth by chance. Okay, now that we have that, we'll we'll go and uh, fabricate the wax bite. Now the wax, again, has to be thoroughly softened. It should be softened uh, uniformly. If there are any hard areas of the wax, it will naturally deflect the patient's jaw. Again, what we need is a thickness of a, approximately the thickness of the molar teeth, so if we roll the wa this base plate wax or so that it is in one quarter, approximately one quarter sections or less, it will be the thickness that we uh, desire. Dry heat can also be used to aid in, uh, in warming the wax thoroughly all the way through. The wax, because of Christensen's phenomenon, as I showed you on the skull, should be perhaps a little thicker in the posterior. So I'm going to turn the tail of the wax over so that it's going to have aid us in, in being a little bit thicker posteriorly. If we have the casts of the patient available, we can utilize them to tell us the dimension of the wax, and we can trim off any overextensions that may occur. Going to have to reheat this. And you can use wet heat also, or dry heat also, to soften it. Again, it should be softened all the way through, heated thoroughly, before taking it to the patient. 
wax, in order to be heated all the way through, must be heated slowly. If we heat it very rapidly, it will uh, melt on the surface and be, still be hard on the inside. Okay, we're going to now take this to the patient. Okay, position it on the maxillary arch. Okay, now bring your jaw forward, forward as you're closing, forward, forward, and close, close, hold it right there. We stop them short of incising the wax. I'm going to trim this away so we can see the relationship of those anterior teeth. We can trim the excess wax from the bite. It, is, it aids us in seeing when the cast is seated properly. Okay, we're wait, going to wait also for the wax to chill before we remove it from the patient's mouth. You know, she must maintain that protrusive, that protrusive uh, excursion all during the uh, trimming of the wax. If a patient is unable to do this, it would probably be better not to trim the wax, uh, but to hold the jaw in that protrusive excursion. Okay, I'm going to open it. Okay, I'm going to just tease the wax bite out without distorting it. And we will now take this wax bite to the articulator to set the horizontal condylar inclination. We're going to set three adjustable parts of the articulator. The first thing we are going to set is the horizontal condylar inclination. This we will use the protrusive wax bite. Uh, the next we will set is the vertical axis of the, condo, of the articulator. And the third thing we will be setting is the incisal guide table. Now, the, in setting the horizontal condylar guidance, we must first release the upper member of the articulator. Let's release the centric lock screws on both sides. This ensures us of having freedom of the upper member of the articulator. Now I'd like to demonstrate the effect of changing the condylar guidance. I'm going to simulate a protrusive excursion of the mandible by bringing the teeth in an end-to-end -end fashion. Now, if I change the condylar inclination, or decrease it, this, in effect, is decreasing the vertical dimension, the dimension of the teeth, say, to the tabletop. It's changing this and decreasing that dimension so the upper cast moves downward. As I increase it, the, the position of the ball goes uh, further upward vertically and the upper part of the cast raises. Now, we use the protrusive wax bite to determine this height, which in effect determines the angulation of the condylar guidance. In the patient, we had the patient make a protrusive movement, and we captured the condyle in, a, in its protrusive fashion. Now, we have this wax bite, and we make sure that it is seated on the maxillary cast uh, perfectly. We should check for various tissue impingements, such as, uh, such as we did with uh, the wax bite when, it, when we checked it in the mouth to make sure that it didn't impinge in the mouth. We want to make sure that it doesn't impinge on the cast in any, in any way so that it fits perfectly. Now we're going to free the upper member, seat the wax bite, 
and put the mandibular teeth into their impressions, and we see that we have the condylar ball has moved back slightly. Now, what I'm going to do is to move this, con change this condylar guidance forward and backward. Now, what, I'm, what I want to see, what I'm looking for, is to see at which point the cast starts to raise and come upward in the anterior. Now, I can see as I'm moving this in the posteriorly, the upper teeth are raising. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is to find out at which point the posterior raises if I move the condylar guidance forward. See, I have it forward, and I'm just wiggling it uh, back and forth. And what I want to do is find at which point, at which point it moves neither forward or backward. And now I find that it's around the 40 degree condylar setting. So I'm going to take that being my condylar guidance. Now the ball is at a certain vertical dimension here, and we're assured that it is that the casts are fitted in into the wax bite. So this simulates the protrusive movement in the patient. Now we must do that bilaterally. And I find that this setting is also in the 40 degree range. One thing we would like to have everyone check before accepting it is that the distance of the protrusive, in other words, how far the condylar ball is from the centric stop, this space, is approximately the same on both sides. See, this space. We make sure that that's approximately the same amount on both sides, which means that the patient has, has made the protrusive excursion uh, in a straightforward fashion rather than a diverging to one side or the other. Okay, now I have the, uh, the condylar settings and I have tightened the thumb screws on the top of the, of the condylar elements and the protrusive is secured. Now I would like to set the vertical axis. We said before that this vertical axis this element rotates about a vertical axis, simulating Bennett's angle. And the setting that we use for it is determined by a formula. The formula is the lateral condylar guidance equals the horizontal condylar guidance over 8 plus 12. Now, this is the average setting. So in our case, the horizontal condylar guidance was 40, so 40 over 8 is 5. Adding it to the 12 makes a reading of 17. Now there is a calibration at the base of the vertical axes. I am going to set that calibration to 17. Now we'll do that also bilaterally. And we have the Bennett angle that we're going to use. Now, the third element of the articulator that we're going to adjust is the incisal guide table. First of all, we will look at a diagrammatic sketch to show the purpose. The incisal guide table is made to duplicate the guidances of the teeth. As the teeth, as we move the, the articulator, the stone teeth will be guiding over each other, possibly causing some abrasion. Now, what we'd like to do is set the incisal guide table to duplicate those guidances. The incisal guide table it should be set absolutely precisely, because if it is not, it will dictate 
the movements within the articulator. So we would like it to be a uh, duplicating but not dictating a piece of uh, the articulator. Now we, we can set the incisal guide table for most cases, but there are some cases at which the angle on the incisal table cannot be set steeply enough to correspond with a more steep relationship of the teeth. If the teeth, the guiding inclines are in such a fashion, this table, it is not a physical possibility for the incisal guide table to be set this steeply. And therefore, we would have to use a customized or a incisal guide table modified with acrylic. We will show two cases. The first case is that of the patient whose cast we have just mounted on the articulator. Initially, we must release the thumb screw on the beneath the incisal table, make sure the incisal table is mobile. We then must have the centric lock screws released so that the upper member of the articulator may be moved back to simulate the protrusive excursion. We must hold it in that fashion, in the protrusive end-to-end -end movement or edge-to-edge -edge relationship of the anterior teeth. And then I will move the table to see if it can come high enough to hit the blade of the incisal pin. In this case, we see that it is a physical impossibility to set the articulator to the incisal guidance of this patient. Because when her anterior teeth are guiding the protrusive excursion, the table cannot be lifted far enough to touch the pin. To make a usable incisal guidance for this case, plastic, moldable plastic, would need to be added to the incisal table and then molded, custom molded, while it was still in a soft state. The next case I'm going to show is one in which the incisal guide table can be set to accept the, uh, the guidances of the teeth. Holding this case in the protrusive fashion, the end-to-end -end relationship, you can see that I could raise the incisal table till it does touch, and now as the incisal pin is going over the incisal table, the anterior teeth are just touching or just missing. If we look at the teeth, we see that they are just barely touching. Now, the table then is doing the, or is following what the teeth are dictating. Now, we can also set the lateral wings of this table. Now, making a, what would be a left working movement of the cast, we see that the pin comes laterally. Now, we can raise the lateral wing of the table until it just touches the pin. Now, the teeth that are guiding the teeth are just touching at the same time the pin is guiding over the table, the working side teeth. Now we can set that adjustment by the little bolt or the little nut bringing it firm against the base of the incisal guidance. That will lock the position. Now we can do the same thing for the opposite side. Bringing the teeth in a lateral excursion, simulating a lateral excursion, then raising the incisal guide table till it touches and setting the lock. Now this ensures that the teeth do
do not abrade when we make the various excursions. If the casts, if the stone casts were made of metal, we could just discard the incisal guide table and pin. In that, in that way, the, we would let the teeth make their guidances over each other, and there would be no loss of vertical dimension through abrasion. We now have the articulator set. We have accomplished our goals. We have the maxillary cast related to the condyles properly through the use of the face bow. We have the mandibular cast in its proper relationship to the maxilla, the maximally interdigitated position, centric occlusion. And we have taken the protrusive excursion and or protrusive uh, bite and have set the horizontal condylar guidance, guidance, the vertical axis through the use of the formula and the incisal guide table, which is now duplicating the guiding guidances of the teeth. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.